Okay, today we're going to be talking about if there's more mass in all of the stars, planets, everything of the whole universe combined, or is there more mass in the vacuum in between? But before we talk about that, we have to understand pressure. So pressure is the average force of the atoms or molecules hitting a surface per area. Here's what I mean. So most of the volume of a gas is just empty space, even in atmospheric pressure. So let's say this is our space, and here's our atoms of gas. So how do they exert pressure on something? Well, I'll show you. So gas molecules aren't just sitting around like this. Because they're a gas, they're flying through space because they have a lot of energy. So let's give our atoms some energy and show you how they can exert pressure on this film on the top. So notice when I hit the atoms and give them more energy, they hit the top surface here and push it away from them. So that's pressure. So in just regular atmospheric pressure at our temperature, the atoms aren't just getting flicked a few times, but they're moving like this. In fact, the average speed of oxygen molecules in this room is around 500 meters per second. So they're moving really fast. So if that's true, why don't the oxygen molecules that are in this cup just push this film off and break it off if they're moving so fast and there are so many in there. Well, it's because there's an equal amount on the top of this cup hitting it and so it keeps the film about where it is. But what happens if you remove all of the molecules that are hitting this side of the film so that only this side of it are hitting it? Well, let me show you using something a little more interesting than a cup. So a Suzy Q is a good example here because it has some pretty good filling in here that has a lot of air bubbles. So the air bubbles have a bunch of air molecules in it, and I'm gonna put them in my vacuum chamber and then remove all of the air molecules from the outside. And so it's gonna show how the air molecules that are in there now don't have any air molecules pushing on the outside of the bubbles, and so the Suzy Qs will expand. Okay, 16 Suzy Qs in the vacuum chamber. Three, two, one. Okay, we're at 0.6 atmospheres in there now. You can see them start to swell up. Oh, there they go, we're at half an atmosphere. Point four atmospheres. Okay, we're at point two atmospheres. Okay, so you can see that as the air pressure decreases in there, the atmospheric pressure that was in the whipped cream began to swell up and expand. But now, as that atmospheric pressure begins to diffuse out of the whipped filling in there, the whip filling begins to depress now because that pressure isn't inside of the bubbles anymore so, and so it begins to smoosh back down. And so as I let it sit here longer and longer, the air pressure that was in the filling and inside of the cake is going to escape. So all of the air is getting sucked out of the whipped cream. You can see, you can see what I'm talking about a little better when I speed it up. Okay, we're ready to let the air in. So there should be a vacuum now in all the bubbles in the whipped filling. So let's see what happens when we let atmospheric pressure in again. Three, two, one. <laughs> wow. So look how cool that is. So look how the filling just changed. So it went from being white to kind of this oily looking grayish color. That's because all of the bubbles and voids that were in there just got flattened down when we lit the air back in. Let's see if they still taste good though. Tastes good. Not as puffy in the middle, but I'll still accept it. So that's why when you put things in a vacuum chamber, usually you see them expand because you're removing the air from the outside and so all of the air that's on the inside just pushes the material away from it. So does that mean that the Suzy Q would expand the same amount if I were to bring it to outer space? Well, the maximum my vacuum chamber can get down to is around 10 pascals. 
And when you're talking about the force that 10 pascals puts per area, it's almost negligible. So even though my vacuum chamber comes nowhere near the vacuum of space, the force of something expanding in my vacuum chamber is pretty much the same force of expansion you get in outer space also. But does that mean my vacuum chamber is comparable to interstellar space vacuum? Well, not even close. Let me give you an idea how different they are. Okay, so at standard atmospheric pressure, if you picture all of the molecules of oxygen and nitrogen bouncing around, bumping into each other, how many times would you say that one molecule bounces and hits another molecule? How many times per second do you think that happens at atmospheric pressure? It's an astonishing amount. So even though most of the volume around it is empty, they're moving so fast and there are so many of them around each other that one molecule gets bumped into around six or seven billion times per second. That's because there's around 10 to the 19 atoms per cubic centimeter at atmospheric pressure. Well, in the vacuum chamber, I can get down to 10 pascals, which is hardly any pressure, but that doesn't mean there's hardly any atoms in there. There's still around a trillion atoms per cubic centimeter in my good vacuum chamber here. Even the best vacuum chambers on Earth still have billions of atoms in them. So what's the best vacuum that's possible in the whole universe? Well, the best vacuum is interstellar space. So this is the area in between star systems, not near our solar system or near any other planet. It's the void of space in between. So the pressure quoted for interstellar space is quite different because it kind of depends on where you are. But on average, it's about 10 to the negative 11 pascals. Remember in my vacuum chamber, I was getting about 10 pascals of pressure, but in interstellar space, we're getting around 10 to the negative 11 pascals, which is a crazy small number. But still, that doesn't mean there's no atoms flying around. On average, in interstellar space, there's about one atom per cubic centimeter. So remember that at atmospheric pressure, we were getting around 6 billion collisions per second. So in interstellar space, how many collisions per second do you think you would get in a meter cubed of space? If you just sat and watched that meter cubed of space, how often do you think you'd see a collision? Well, it would be around once every 900 years. So around once every 900 or 1,000 years, you get two atoms that happen to cross each other's path and hit each other. Quite statistically improbable for a collision to happen in interstellar space between two atoms. And that's how good of a vacuum interstellar space actually is. But like I said, interstellar space is not empty still. One atom per cubic centimeter about. So that means that interstellar space is not actually a perfect vacuum. There's the old adage that says, nature abhorreth a vacuum, meaning it's impossible to get a perfect vacuum. But I've always wondered about that and I've wondered why couldn't you just take the space where it doesn't have an atom in it currently and put a box around that and then call that a perfect vacuum. Wouldn't that work? Well, even if you could do that by just putting a box around that empty space, the box itself would then leach atoms into that empty space so it would no longer be a vacuum. And so the best possible vacuum we can get is interstellar space. But here's the really mind blowing thing. Even though interstellar space is almost a perfect vacuum, it's not, and it has material in it and space is really, really, really big. So that means there's a lot of material in this empty vacuum. So of the known mass in the universe, not including dark mass or dark energy, it's estimated that only about 10% of that mass is in stars and planets and everything. 90% of it is in the vacuum in between. So that means that there's more stuff in the vacuum of space than in the non-vacuum of space. And that's really weird to think about. There's more stuff in the nothingness than there is in the something part of space. And because that vacuum of space has so much stuff in it, more stuff than in all the stars of the entire universe, scientists call it actually a name. They call it the interstellar medium. The interstellar medium is just like any other flowing fluid. It has turbulence in it, it moves around, it has different parts of it that are more dense than other parts. So it's almost like a material on its own. So if you think of it that way, it's almost like there's no vacuum of space. The vacuum of space is something in and of itself, an interstellar medium. Hey everybody, thanks for watching another episode of The Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it and you're not subscribed yet, remember to hit the subscribe button, hit the bell to be notified when my latest video is out, 
And you can leave me any questions or comments that you have in the comment section and I'll try to get to them and I'll see you next time.